Okay, this is going to be, I think it's a really interesting lecture. I'm going to talk about a new cause of dementia, a new cause of multiple sclerosis, and explain the relationship between the teeth and the brain. Multiple sclerosis was first described in 1868 by this doctor here. This is Charcot. He's a very famous genius neurologist from France. He was also kind of stuck up, kind of pompous, which is characteristic of French men, you know. One of my relatives was married to a lady whose father was from Morocco, and he's a French guy from Morocco, but he spoke Arabic and he spoke French, and he would say he's French. And my mom was very funny. She used to tease him. She'd say, oh, you are not French. You're an Arab from Morocco. And he goes, no, I am French. She said, no, you're not. You're an Arab from Morocco. And he would get all upset. And the whole thing was just funny. I mean, he was a nice guy. He was a smart guy. It was just funny. You know, it'd be a typical example of how my mom would tease someone. Anyways... This guy was a neurologist. He got himself into all sorts of things. He was also involved in hypnotism, and this is a famous patient of his, his I think Blanche or something, Blanche Dubois or something like that. And Freud went to go study with him. He's a very famous, world-famous neurologist, Charcot. There's other diseases, diseases named after him as well. So it was like the most famous places in the world. And the hospital is a Salpetrier in Paris, France with Charcot. So that's the name of this painting, Charcot at the Salpetrier. Well, anyways, he's the first to describe multiple sclerosis, 1868. And the significance of that date, 1868, was that was only a couple decades after mercury amalgam started becoming widespread. And there's a lot of people who've researched it rather extensively, and they believe that it was first described in 1868 because it was primarily caused due to mercury amalgams. But there's other reasons why it can happen due to root canal. And, you know, just to let you know, I still think that, I do think mercury probably does cause it, but I actually think that there's other causes of it more important. Um, I think, um, uh, here, here, by the way, is a paper from a neurology journal that uh, it was first described in 1868 by Jean-Martin Charcot. Okay. Now, here is the... Uh, Roy Swank book, you know, he's an MD-PhD guy from Harvard, and he followed patients, look at this study, following patients for over 34 years, and of his early diagnosed MS patients who followed his diet, low fat, especially low sat fat, 95% of them were intact for ADLs, activities of daily living, which is rather extraordinary, okay? So I do think that that's the main issue eating the low-fat, plant-based diet. And he's not the only one. Here is Sari Stanchik, and this is a good book. She made a little movie about it as well, how she had multiple sclerosis, and she got better when she went uh, low-fat vegan, okay? She had a funny comment in her book. She talked about how residency trains doctors to be unhealthy. They're sleep-deprived, they eat junk food all the time, and they're totally stressed out. Okay, now here's a guy, a big dog and dentist, one of the all-time geniuses of dentistry. His name is Hal Huggins, and he wrote this book, Solving the MS Mystery. He took out amalgams and root canals in over 1,000 patients. He was said he would get 15 to 20 phone calls every day of patients wanting their amalgams and root canals removed for treatment of MS. So in a patient who's not getting better from the diet, I would try this. I mean, what have you got to lose? All right. And he claims extraordinary results, and he's not the only one. There's a bunch of other dentists claim the same thing. And you read Gamal's book. He's a big believer in it, too. And these are, you know, top-notch dentists, top-of-the-line guys, okay? All right, so here's just one paper talking about the association between mercury and uh, multiple sclerosis. There's tons of them in that book. And now let's talk a little bit about the mechanism. How could this be possible? How could one even say such a thing? These are the deep veins of the face. The deep veins of the face, including those related to the mandible, the lower jaw, and the maxilla, the upper part of the jaw, they are in communication with the cavernous sinus. That's right in the center of the brain, okay, right next to the pituitary. And they're bidirectional flow in these veins, and they don't have valves. So, you know, so you can lay on your side, lay on your stomach, lay on your back, right side, left side. And you can still drain out your brain, your skull. You got emissary veins, you know, they traverse the skull to drain the venous blood from the skull. All right, so what I'm saying is there's bidirectional flow. So something in this vein can get up to the brain vein. And if that same thing is lipophilic, meaning that it passes through a phospholipid bilayer, a fatty membrane around a cell, it can cross the blood brain barrier. So that is known. They've also done injections. I think it was Storderbrecher who did it, you know, back in the 1960s, who would inject a contrast material, and he could opacify the veins in the brain by injecting the, the veins in the upper and the lower jaw. 
Okay, so we know the veins communicate. We know there's a temporal possible association between amalgams and MS. All right, Storderbrecher also went and he, at autopsy, he looked at the veins uh, in the brain and he felt they looked like they were related to MS, mercury, and, inf and infectious toxins, more so than a primary demyelinating disease to suggest uh, autoimmune disease. So do I think it's multifactorial? Yes, I do. From what I've read, I think both things will cause it. There's a lot of neurologic diseases that have more than one cause. I think Parkinson's has multiple possible causes, okay? Also, there was a dentist by the name of Ingalls who had multiple sclerosis, and he felt that there was an association of more MS lesions on the side where the patient had more amalgams, okay? Now, here's a uh, case of MS, and what one can see here is the, this isn't the best MRI image in the world. This is a flare MRI, which is basically a T2-weighted sequence with uh, cerebral spinal fluid suppression, CSF suppression. That's why the ventricle fluid is dark. The fluid in the you know, subarachnoid space around the cell side is also dark. But pathologic fluid, water-like fluid, is hyperintense, bright. Anyways, these little perpendicular lesions, perpendicular to the ventricle, that is, has a characteristic name. That's called Dawson's fingers. And there are veins that are perpendicular uh, to the lateral ventricles at this location. So these are perivenous flare hyperintensities consistent with demyelinating disease, consistent with multiple sclerosis. Well, there's my point. They're perivenous lesions. This distribution is highly characteristic of multiple sclerosis. And it's kind of a distribution one might find if you had some type of retrograde venous flow with a molecule, a toxin, traversing the blood-brain barrier, okay? So what I'm saying is there's good mechanistic reasons to believe this stuff. It's not like it's far-fetched. It totally makes sense. All right, so here's just the venous anatomy showing that the veins, just like you would expect, the nerves, just like the veins, they go back from the lower jaw, the mandible, right up to the cavernous sinus region. The trigeminal nerve passes right in contact with the cavernous sinus, okay? Part of it like goes through it. Okay, and then here is, you know, the maxillary uh, division of the trigeminal. Trigeminal just means three parts. So there's one part, the ophthalmic goes up by the eyes, the maxillary branch goes by the nose and the upper jaw, the mandibular branch goes to the lower jaw, the mandible, okay? And you see how these nerves supply to teeth. They go right into the bottom of the teeth, and right down around here is where the infection problems happen. I'll show you that on the next slide. Okay, here's the anatomy of a typical tooth. And for a typical tooth, we've got um, the crown is the enamel. That's what you see when you look in the mirror. The dentine is a big bulk of the tooth, and that's sort of the, the material in between the enamel and the pulp space. This is the pulp space. The arteries and veins enter and exit through the apex of the tooth. This is called the apex of the tooth. Okay, and the nerve also. Nerves in yellow, arterial blood flows in red, venous blood flows in blue. Okay, so you want to remember that. You can also see if there's an infection in the pulp space, it's clearly understandable how it could spread out through the apex of the tooth into the adjacent bone. So this would be the bone of the mandible. Okay. Here also shows the progression of an infection, how a cavity starts out just in the, enamel, in the enamel right here. This is a cavity in the enamel. Here it is spread now from the enamel into the dentine. Okay, now here it is spread from the dentine into the pulp space. And here it's spread along the pulp space and all the way down the root of the tooth to the apex of the tooth and into the adjacent bone of the mandible. So the, the, bone, the bone of the mandible is a little bit aerated. You'll call those alveolar bone. And sometimes you'll see that term, but it just means the mandible or the lower jaw. And here is the abscess, the pus, pus pocket there. Peri means around, dont means tooth, itis means infection or inflammation. So periodontitis means inflammation or infection around the uh, tooth. If it was in the gums, it would be gingivitis, okay? Okay, this infection of the pulp space is called pulpitis. Now, this is a different type of picture showing the same thing. A cavity spread down through the pulp space, down through the apex of the tooth, now infecting the bone. And you can see how this could get into the, this is just showing an artery, but it could get into a vein very easily. Infection of bone is called osteomyelitis. So this being the apex of the tooth, we'd see a periapical lucency of destroyed bone on x-ray or CAT scan. Okay, that's periapical osteomyelitis. If it's causing pain in the bone, 
they'll sometimes call it um, a, a NICO, like a neuralgia-inducing cavitary osteomyelitis. Now, I'll show you some more pictures of what all this looks like. The main, the main reason I'm going through all this is to show you how a dental infection can affect the brain and potentially contribute to causing multiple sclerosis or dementia. It also is going to contribute to uh, bacterial toxins getting into the blood, which can then induce amyloid clotting. I gave previous lectures on the concept of amyloid clotting. Uh, Douglas Kellen at Theresia Pretosis, uh, uh, Pretorius are the big experts on the subject, and they'll call it also uh, fibrinoloid uh, clotting. So here you can see a tooth, and with infection spread to the adjacent bone, it can damage the nerve. It can even demyelinate the nerve, okay? You can get retrograde axonal transport along the nerve back into the trigeminal ganglion, okay? Back into the brain. All right, here's showing, you know, infection, necrotic cavity, and this is, you know, pre-necrotic infection here. Okay. Now here's just showing a bone that's devascularized. Here's normal looking bone where it's more uh, yellowish and you can see the alveolar spaces in there. This is sort of murky with pus in it. This is cavitational uh, osteonecrosis, okay? This is bad. You gotta drain this, you gotta debride this, surgically remove it or it'll be very difficult to treat. Because it doesn't have good perfusion, doesn't have good blood vessel, uh, reach inside of it because the abscess kind of pushes away the blood vessels and they're necrosed, destroyed. You got to debride that or you might not be able to cure it with just the antibiotics alone. That's an important point. Okay, now here's an x-ray and here is the root of a tooth. So here's the tooth next to it right here and notice that you have a normal appearance of the apex. Whereas next to the apex of this tooth, you've got all this loosened space. That's destroyed bone by uh, by osteomyelitis, bone infection, pus. Here's a more subtle early periodontitis, early periapical lucency, early periapical abscess. Either way, this tooth needs to be extracted and they need to debride this bone to clear that out. Otherwise, it'll tend to have a walled off abscess which can continue to release toxins and even have bacteria escape into the blood. So this is a plain film appearance of uh, periapical uh, periodontitis bone osteomyelitis. Now here's a cone beam CT scan and you can see there's some abnormal increased lucency here in the bone, abnormal increased lucency at the site of a previous removed molar tooth, abnormal increased lucency here at the site of a, of a previously removed molar tooth. So the concern is those are you know potentially periapical uh, cavitations and uh, bone osteomyelitis, bone necrosions. And if the patient has nerve pain like a NICO, neuralgia-inducing cavitational osteonecrosis. So the bottom line is it's an infection of the bone, of the jawbone, of the mandible, and it's a bad thing, okay? And it's going to need surgical debridement to treat it. And a lot of dentists are barely even aware of this, okay? But they, they need to know about it because they can be real subtle. And the one I'm going to talk about is a real subtle one as, as I'm moving towards showing you how subtle this can be. Here's pretty standard dental extraction forceps, kind of a brutal looking instrument to pull the tooth out. The real smart dentist like Gamal talks about using a luxator, which kind of is like a flat screwdriver and it goes down around the root of the tooth and you kind of free up the root so you'll be more easily able to extract it and whole and complete. And that's what you want to do. You don't want to have the, the tip of the root apex break off because then you're more likely to have complications. Okay, so here's showing that root extraction forceps the little uh, sort of pinkish line in here is the periodontal ligament. That has to be scraped out too. If you scrape out the periodontal ligament, then the bone underneath recognizes there's a problem and it'll be more likely to heal and form new bone. If you leave the periodontal ligament in there, then this will get colonized by bacteria and it'll form an infection, often leading to cavitations. Normally what they try to do is just put a blood clot in there and they try to secure that in place and hopefully it won't fall out. This will be why they'll tell the patient don't go anywhere after this procedure. Sit in the chair for a while, rest, and let this blood clot get more formed. Because the blood clot forms and gradually uh, it'll sort of activate the immune system to reestablish bone forming cells in here and it'll heal normally and reestablish that bone. If you leave the periodontal ligament in here, there's a pretty high risk that this spot's going to get infected. You'll end up with what's called a cavitation. That's important to know if you're getting an amalgam tooth removed or a root canal removed. You need to know that. You must remove the periodontal ligament. The best dentists make a big deal about it. Now, I just want to show you what kind of BS Wikipedia is. Wikipedia, as far as I can tell, must be owned by the billionaire perverts, and it's used to trick the proles. Because I'm telling you, you know, about trivial things, it'll tell you the truth, but when there's something important, it will tell you, look at this, it'll say, Removal of 
Nico has been described as quackery by some dentists and maxillofacial surgeons. And what I would say is, are you out of your freaking mind? Every doctor knows if you have osteomyelitis, you need to clean it up. And if it's refractory to antibiotics, which it very often is, you need to surgically debride it. That's not really open to debate. Uh, so, you know, you don't want to leave a gangrenous toe on the body. This is, you know, for some reason, dentistry is dug in its heels and it's like says, don't remove root canals, don't remove amalgams. There's a lot of really well-informed people that strongly recommend it. And everything I can read says that the information's on their side. So I'm just letting you know, you'll run into this type of stuff. You'd be surprised how much nonsense there is in the establishment dental literature. All right, well, anyways, I hope you found that interesting. And what's extraordinary about that is this is an explanatory mechanism for how the mercury from amalgams can cause brain damage, how infected root canals typically colonize with bacteria that have changed from aerobic to anaerobic, thus producing anaerobic type toxins like the mercaptans and the thioethers can cause brain damage that could lead to Parkinson's, that could lead to multiple sclerosis, that could lead to dementia. And the great thing about this is I wouldn't show it to you if there was nothing you could do. Is there something you could do? You could take that tooth out. So if somebody's in the early phase of dementia, oh yeah, and why else do I care about this? Because I look at you know tens of thousands of demented brains and very often the most common thing I see in a CT scan is shrunken brain, one or two cataract surgeries, and terrible teeth or no teeth. And patients who are edentulous having no teeth, they very often have a bunch of cavitations. I'm reading more and more about this and the, the people that are in the know, they're like, you got to scope out these cavitations and scoop them out. Otherwise, you're going to have a pus factory, a toxin factory, releasing these toxins into the body that can cause other systemic types of illness. And they've even talked about things like injecting the pus pocket uh, with local anesthetic. And they sometimes think that can give you a result, like that can diminish the symptoms if you have a, a, a pain related to an acupuncture meridian. Now, I know a lot of people think acupuncture is total BS. I don't think it's total BS. I do think it's partly BS. But I do think this idea of injecting local anesthetics, I'm telling you, I'm seeing this from all the smartest dentists, the top of the top of the line, okay? And they're saying, this is what you gotta do. And these people are serious, okay? Weston Price, his son died from a root canal. After that, he researched it and he found root canals have tons and tons of terrible complications. He would take infected root canal teeth, he'd implant them under the skin of a rabbit, and let's say the human patient died from cardiac infection, endocarditis the rabbit would die from endocarditis. He would take that tooth out from underneath the rabbit, put it in another rabbit, that rabbit would die from endocarditis, okay? Rabbit got kidney, the a patient died from kidney failure, he took the tooth out, put it in a rabbit, the rabbit died from kidney failure. He did this over and over, sometimes they would repeat that in like 100 rabbits, okay? And they would get the same thing. He was not messing around. He wanted to redeem himself because he felt that he had killed his son by being an ignoramus and he was pissed off. And the guy's a genius, Weston Price, he really is. So I'm telling you, it's impressive stuff. Weston Price published tons of papers at the highest level. He was the head of dental research until he started bad-mouthing root canals and they fired him and tried to discredit him. But I'm telling you, it's impressive stuff. So anyways, there it is. Hope you found that helpful.